There may be no more striking uh, passage in Scripture to me outside of Jesus' life than that of his teaching of the prodigal son. You know, I think the reason it hits me so deeply is I find myself in so many characters in that story. The only character I don't find myself in is the father. I, I, I keep picturing myself, it, let's just walk through the story together. This, this man had at least two sons that we know of in the story. And it, as the story goes, one of the sons looks to his dad one day and he says, I want my inheritance now. And the dad willingly cashes out land or goods or whatever he had and gives it to the son. The son takes those goods, that money, and he goes into the city and it says that he lives extravagantly for a season. The problem is it runs out. At which point the son goes, well, I can't go home, so I'll work. So he does. He, he does some odd jobs and he ends up at kind of the end of his particular story of, of slopping pigs. Now, if you've ever been around pigs, they'll eat everything, including each other, right? And so he's looking at the slop, and he goes, hey, I, that looks really tasty. And then it dawns on him, I can go back and just serve my dad's household. He would take me as a servant, and I know how his servants live, and that sounds better than what I'm doing. And so he runs back home, and the father in the story is looking for his son from his homestead. He never quits hoping that his son will come home. And it says he sees him far off and rushes out to meet him. And in this moment, he embraces his son. He tells his household, bring a robe, bring a ring, kill a fatted calf. My son who was dead is now home. But then there's the other brother who's worked. He's probably the brother that had to work double hard because now the father had less than ever. And he toiled and he labored and he didn't cash out. He toiled. And so there he sees his brother getting the party of the century from the father. And he says, what is this all about? I have stayed. I'm the good kid. And you don't ever throw parties for me. What is this about? And the father looks at him and goes, your brother is home. They never give the end of that brother's story. Jesus doesn't go back to that story and go, part two. Then the brother slayed his younger brother and said, vengeance is mine. It doesn't do that. We don't get part two. We just get the party. And so I find myself in those two brothers, the one that has taken what God has given me and squandered it in the the son that feels self-entitled when those that have squandered get all the goods and I don't and I have to go, but what about me, God? Haven't I done my stuff too? And maybe you haven't been like that. Maybe you have served the Lord and you don't ever look around anywhere else and so, you know, when, when others get something or they get to experience something, you're just like, I'm good with that. I see myself in both brothers. Like I said, the only character in that story that Jesus tells that I don't find myself in is this father who lavishly loves at all times with no preference. Because that's not me. I love what I love, how I love, and when I love. Is that enough love? See, in this story, Jesus wanted us to capture something. That day when he told that story, he knew the crowd, and he knew what person they saw themselves as as well. So when he told it, he's looking into the eyes of people that go, that stupid younger brother, I hate that guy. He also saw the other brother that just worked but never really showed up and had compassion for a brother that came home. You know, in Proverbs, I told you we'd come back to it eventually. There's a passage 
that repeats itself. It's interesting because there's so many, I believe, Proverbs that I would have tripled or quadrupled because they're just amazing. But this is one passage that's duplicated for a reason. Proverbs 14, Proverbs 14, verse 12 says, There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Isn't that a great passage? There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. So we get that in Proverbs 14, but turn in your Bibles with me to Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16, verse 25. What does it say? There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. Why is this repeated? You know, for those of y'all that are Bible scholars, anytime something's repeated, the writer wanted you to do what? Pay attention. It's kind of like when your mom would say, take out the trash. And then we come back to your room and said, take out the trash. And then she would say, wait until your father gets home. What did you do then? You took out the trash. In Proverbs, we get these two scriptures that are identical in nature. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to or of death. You know, I think this is perhaps one of those passages that we need to really wrestle with today. We need to hang on to and really chew on the marrow of. We need to dive deeply because if we miss this passage, we will continue to walk whichever way we think is right. And ultimately, if it's not God's plan and God's way, its end is death. That was real. Did y'all hear that? Death. I couldn't even repeat it. That was awesome. Anyways, this is the problem. Most of our world declares to itself that it knows its own way, which is why when we learn that our ways are not always best, it shocks us. So Disney released a series a while back after owning Star Wars called The Mandalorian. In The Mandalorian, they say this particular line, all the time. This is the way, you bunch of nerds. Anyways, I'm with you. I love it. Love it. This is the way. They say it to one another all the time. Anytime the Mandalorian are together, the Mandalore, they repeat it back to each other. At the end of a sentence or end of a conversation, they say, this is the way. And they repeat back. Beautiful. See, y'all aren't completely asleep yet. This is the way. And the reason they say that is to remind themselves that this choice to be a Mandalore is something, and it's a creed to hold on to, a lifestyle to maintain, things like you never take off your helmet, which is always awkward during flu season. There's just certain things they do that were different. And when you break that code, you can no longer be a Mandalore. The problem that we have in the Christian faith is we don't think that we have to adhere to anything, which is why Paul argues, should I send that grace may abound? I mean, certainly we are saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. And certainly we know that once we are in Christ, there is no longer a price of sin. He has paid it in full via the cross. But does it mean that we openly sin because we are saved? Scripture tells us very clearly that those that have a knowledge of Jesus but choose willful sin, they acknowledge that there is no way through Christ. Which is a real trouble to us, right? Because all of a sudden we have to start to deal with, am I truly living the way? Or am I toying with it? Am I really truthfully a part of this Jesus thing, or am I just kind of acting? So how do we know if we are doing life correctly? How do we know? 
How can you and I, as Christians, those that profess faith in Jesus, truthfully know that we're doing this the right way? Or is it just a a guess? Or is it just being better than the person in the pew next to you today? I mean, is that is that how we do this? That we just go, hey, listen, I don't do what they do, so I must be doing this right. I want to remind you what Christian really means. It started off as the most derogatory thing that could be mentioned. People trying to poke fun. You are a little Christ. But we have adopted that as the name that we are saved under, that once we come to know Christ, we become Christians And we start to act like little Christ. The problem is if Christianity looks like the like the bulk of what we see exhibited, Christ is busted. Right? Like if 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 what we exhibit as a whole is the best of Jesus, he wasn't that good. But you and I know that's not true. You and I know that Jesus is holy that he lived a perfect life, that he was compassionate and kind, forgiving and loving. And because of that, that's what we have to exhibit. We feel like we as Christians need to, I don't know, carry a sword and scream loudly, when in fact we should love deeply and compassionately. We should point people to the heart of Christ, because you and I could not do anything to gain that or to earn it, we were saved. That's an amazing word, saved. Because to be saved from a flood, what has to happen? You have to have a hero to be saved. Being saved from a flood is not an actionable that you can do. You must have a hero to show up. To be saved means that you and I needed a hero Because on our own, we could not do anything about sin. We were, at best, sunk. And so Jesus shows up, and he jumps right in the middle of our flood. And he he looks around, and he goes, I know what you feel like. I know what this feels like. I'm feeling it. And I want you to know we can beat this. And our hero in the story does something amazing. While we're struggling for air and trying to come up above the water, he dives down deeply and he lifts us. And he dies for us. But he doesn't stay that way. On the shore of salvation, as we sit there and we take that breath, we look and here comes our hero. Walking on the water. It's a beautiful thought to know that our hero knew the story from the beginning and chose it anyway. Amen. I'm always reminded when I'm around a beautiful landscape like uh, the canyon in Paladero there. When you look at it, scientists say, millions of years ago, water went through this area and carved out these you know, rocks and it did this on its own. And you go, Nope. My God is an artist. Case in point, if it was such a coincidence, why isn't all of Amarillo a canyon? You ever wondered that? How did he do it in such a way, if it was a coincidence, that it starts over here and it carves through the end of our neighborhood here at Quell Creek and then stops and kind of just goes shallow and then goes really deep the other side of canyon. It's coincidence, right? Right? No. Ordained by a creator, made by a master artist who knows exactly what he's doing. Thus, we have the lighthouse tower. Come on, water doesn't stop that, an artist creates it. Can he use water? He can use anything he wants. He made it. He made it. He could could do this and make it. He doesn't have to use anything else. 
But everything in creation speaks of God. And Scripture tells us that when you and I quit praising Him, the rocks will start up. They'll just click away. I think that's what they sound like. Anyways, (laughs) Philippians 4 tells us this. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence and if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. How do we know if we're walking in the way? We'll be surrounded by the artistry of God. Truth, honor, justice, purity. I mean, you can just see it in how he speaks to us. How do we know that we're living life correctly? We won't look like the world does. The world cannot look like a true Christian without Christ. It can't. It's an impossibility. You know why? Because life happens. And when you squeeze an apple, lemon juice doesn't come out. Unless you got it at McDonald's and that's all it tastes like is lemon juice. But when you squeeze an orange, you don't get Coca-Cola. Because what's in it is what comes out of it. So when the world lies and tells you it's a Christian and you squeeze on it, Jesus can't come out because there's no Jesus in it. Y'all remember the old commercial? Let's date ourselves a little bit. Three old women show up. Stare at a burger place. They open up the bun and say, Y'all are a bunch of old people. Uh, Yeah, where's the beef? Where is the beef? The world is opening so many doors and asking, Where's the peace? Where's the joy? Where's the love? Where is Jesus? And they're hoping that there's people that walk in the way that say, let me show you. Let me take you there. I would love to show you the way. You see, when Christians really start to live out our faith, the way becomes very simple to Jesus. People aren't hindered by broken Christianity. They're led by wholehearted saved people that always are in community with Jesus anyway. When I first moved to Amarillo um, 14 years ago, I'll remember when I first got here, there were some people on staff, and we were going to go meet for lunch across town. And they said, okay, Kyle, this is how you get there. What you're going to do is you're going to drive to where the old mall used to be. Some of y'all know where that's at. I said that, and you're like, and then what? Let me just tell you something. There is no old mall in my memory. It wasn't there. Nay, nay. It was never there. They're like, oh, yeah, you remember? uh, It's also where that old place used to be. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Did not grow up here. Do not understand Amarillo. Now, I want you to know something. The reason they did this is, if you tell me to drive west on a a city street, you're speaking Greek. Just say, listen, get to the light, look for Chick-fil-A. Pass it. It'll be on your right. I can find a Chick-fil-A, and it can be on my right. But when you say, remember when that old Payless shoe store used to be in this particular shopping mall? I'd go, No. No, you remember. No, I don't. You don't remember. I wasn't here when you were little. That's your memory loss. Um, The problem with us teaching people the way to Christ is so many of us have forgotten what it felt like to be lost. We've forgotten how to show people the way. Some of us need to go revisit the cross. We need to remember how saved and how lost we were before we were saved. You see, our friends out there that don't know Christ, they're not broken goods. They're just like you. 
just like me. We're no better than that. We equally needed the same amount of blood shed by Christ as they did. So when we see them, we can't go, (laughs) get a life, buddy. Jesus says, I want them to have mine. (laughs) Go show them the way. You see, we've forgotten that somewhere. We've lost the wonder of Jesus. And so we get confused. As Christians, the longer we forget how radically we were saved, the more we will find ourselves toying with the enemy. Isaiah 5.20 says this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You ever mistaken in a recipe salt and sugar? You know it real quick. There are some times when you're trying to make something savory that if you put sugar in it and you go to taste it, it's ruined. And then there are some times when you're making something really sweet and delicious that if you double up that salt, oh, buddy, your cholesterol jumps, doesn't it? You go, whoo, you can't eat too much salt and not make a sound. It just comes out of you. You go, whoa, ha, that's awful. You, you have to say something. It's, it's tangible. In our lives, we have got to remind ourselves of the way. And we've got to remind ourselves of this because there's people out there looking for it, and we keep tasting the bitter and wondering why. When Jesus called us to this life that was meant to be patterned after his and showing people that same pattern. The problem we have is we've forgotten the way. Call it amnesia. Call it whatever you want. I simply call it sin. Sin will delete your version of the way eventually. Even as a Christian, you toy long enough, the way won't seem that significant to you. You have to have a moment of remembering the way. We have to live our lives in pursuit of the Lord's way. To call yourself a Christian, you cannot live like the world and hope to receive the way of Jesus at the same time. It's an impossibility. You can't walk two paths. Eventually, you will break. I think for many people, especially as Christians, we willfully choose to live broken. Because the way seems too difficult. Don't ever forget. The way of life is narrow. And few follow it. The way of brokenness is wide. And it seems like a good path. But its end is destruction. That's why I believe in Proverbs 14.12 and Proverbs 16.25. We get that passage. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, its way is death. Because I think left to our own, we'll always choose the back roads that seem less taken because it seems adventurous, not following the map left before us. Jesus is talking with his disciples one day. John 14. Y'all know this passage. He's reminding them of what's about to happen. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare, if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. So that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way I'm going. Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? I love that that question. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you also know my Father. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. 
Jesus is the way. So the question is today, are you following it? Are you following the way? You'll know. Because there's some things that Jesus just said that we need to remind ourselves of. When you're following the way, you'll live in truth. If you can see today that truth is not on your path, you may be on the wrong path. He doesn't only say this, but he also says that he is the life. If today you would say that you don't dwell in life, you're discouraged, you're beat down, you don't see hope, you don't experience joy, you may be on the wrong path. Having Jesus as your Savior does not omit you from the world. Amen. There is, has to have been hundreds if not thousands of people on 9-11 that were Christians. They lost their lives that day. It doesn't omit you from this world. It just means that we know that this is not our home. And that we have a citizenship in a place that doesn't feel like this. I'm reminded all the time of something. When I was in my 20s, I didn't think much about life. I just lived. Nothing really hurt unless I broke something. In my 40s, I hurt just getting out of bed. I had to look at April and say, did you hit me? What? What what, what is this? And life starts to seem shorter. It seems like as time keeps going, years seem to get shorter for me now. Some of y'all feel this. Well, used to feel like I can remember the start of school. To get to the end of the school year felt like it took eight years. And now when you see students crossing the stage, you can remember what they look like as babies. And you're like, when did they grow up? That's that snotty kid, right? Everyone's like, yeah, shut up. You're loud right now. It's just graduate. They're praying. You're like, what? Oh, thank you, Lord, for the snotty kid. Um, life goes quick. And it just seems like every day our world keeps getting worse. Amen. Feels like in my soul. That like every new day, somebody hates somebody else so much that they kill them. And it it seems like every country wants what the other country's got. And I watch the news and I just say, Lord, when will you return? How long, Lord? And he goes, just stay in the way. You see, when you and I truly believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, not only will we show people the way, we will get in the way. We won't hide. We'll stand in the gap. We will be in the way for the sake of the way. And Maybe today you, you may be like, listen, that was a lot of Jesus talk. Um, and maybe you're new to church and maybe this is just a lot and listen I get it feels heavy and, and I understand that but I want you to know something that as Christians we are called to equip one another this is the place we come to church for two key purposes to worship Jesus and to be challenged to leave here and look like him so that's why we have to talk like this some Sundays like we have to dig in a little bit deeper But maybe that's not your relationship with God at all. Maybe you see God like a mean father. Maybe you see God as a judge. I want to take you back to where we started, to the story that Jesus told, the two sons. The one that ran off and squandered every half of everything the father owned, his inheritance. 
and then shows back up smelling like pig slop. It's not how he left, but it's how he came back. And another son that's looking on saying, have you forgotten me? And of course the father hadn't. You see, at this point, everything the father owns is that boy's. Everything. Where did the father find himself when that son returned? Waiting. Just watching. You imagine day after day, oh, where is he? Where is that boy? I always think it's interesting. The father sent that son off with money to live a lifetime. The father had built that over his lifetime. So why is he waiting for him? Why isn't he reclining in the house? Even if the son came back, why is he waiting? Why is that where the father's at? Because the father knows his son. He knew it before he sold half of what he had. He knew everything about that boy. And he loved him enough to wait on the porch for him. God loves you so much that not only did he send his only begotten son into the world to die for us, he stands on the porch and waits for you today. No matter how deep into the slop you've gotten, he waits for you like he waited for me. Today, this morning, I, I want you to do me a favor. If the Father waited for you and you showed up with slop and he forgave you and loved you and forgave you of your sins, would you raise your hand? Is that your story? The Father waited for you? Amen. Amen. Me too. Me too. So today, if you're in this room and you don't know Jesus, just know that there are all those hands today are people just like you, who the Father waited on, and he waits for you today as well. Amen. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for my friends in this room. Lord, I pray that you would engage them right where they are, Lord. Lord, you love them so much that you stand and wait. Lord, I pray today that today would be the day that would say, you've waited long enough. Lord, the Bible tells us that there's sin. Every one of us has it. We've all caught it. We're all infected with it. We all have sinned and fallen short of what you wanted us to be. But you loved us while we were your enemies. While we were still in the slop, you loved us. You died for us and you willfully forgive us if we will repent, if we'll get rid of the sin, if we will come home. Today you can forgive us of our sin and forget them. But what's more is we need a father. We need a father who will be with us. We need your guidance. We need your wisdom. We need you to be our Lord. So would you speak over us today as we worship you? Would you be with us during this time of invitation? Would you speak now, Lord? We pray this in your name. Amen.